You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 213, Do Good Works Contribute to Salvation? I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Well, today, um, talking about salvation, I guess it's the number one topic. <laughs> if there is a number one topic, uh, it's kind of a big deal here. And, uh, you know, we've we've touched on good works several times, so I'm interested yeah. to see what you add to the conversation. Yeah, I mean, this this keeps coming up, and I remember in our it, this kind of grows out of the Q&A episode that we had after the book of Hebrews, because... You know, the book of Hebrews is just really so focused on believers, you know, staying in the faith. And we often talked in our series in Hebrews and then, of course, in the Q&A about, you know, the emphasis there is is to keep believing. It's not, you know, to do X number of works and then you sort of cross the finish line, you break the tape and then you're in. So there's this just the, the the subject matter in Hebrews often lent itself to this conversation about faith and works and lapsing in faith. Oh, does that mean I sinned? I committed a sin and now I lose my salvation, you know, those kinds of discussions. So uh, in view of the fact that we got questions about that in the Q&A, even after the whole series, and again, there were a few particular ones in there, I had made the comment in that Q&A, boy, we need to just sort of devote a, an, an episode to this, and this is that episode. And I'll be honest with you, you know, ha- having sort of run over this territory with a considerable amount of frequency uh, in, in, in the series in Hebrews and in other places, I didn't quite know uh, how to structure this so that it would be sort of different. But, you know, I thought about that for 10 or 15 minutes, and then I just sort of threw it to the wind and abandoned it. And what I'm going to do is we're going to just go through several propositions, just ideas, statements, and then we're going to read a lot of scripture uh, in this episode and, and again, focus on what, what the text says. That's what we try to do here and sort out the, the faith and works thing. So for many people, you know, this is, this is going to sound a little bit axiomatic, like, oh, this is so obvious. You know, why would this even be a question? But for a lot of believers, it is a question. So if you're not uh, struggling with this, don't you know? Check out. Uh, I can almost guarantee that you know someone in your church or your family or your circle of friends who does struggle with with some of these things, and so you want to you know listen, direct them to this, pay attention, and share things yourself. You know, with with other believers that you know. So, with you know, having said that, having set it up like that, our comments about works are really going to be focused primarily on on post-cross works. So in other words, the the idea of working your way into heaven is, again, pretty patently obvious uh, that that's not what salvation is about. But we are going to spend a few few moments you know, discussing that as we begin. But for the bulk of, of our time, it's going to be on, well, okay, if works aren't about salvation, then what, what's the point? You know why? Why do we care about living uh, in a certain way? You know what? What? What's the whole point of this? If it doesn't contribute to salvation, if, it, if it's not essential for salvation, then well, why do we bother? So that's where we're going in the episode. So let's start again with the whole. You know, just a, a, a several propositions, and you know, faith and works. I think at the outset we need to realize that faith and works are not rivals to each other. They should not be pitted against one another. And the latter, works, does not supplement the former as though the former, faith, is somehow deficient. Like you have really strong faith, you understand the gospel, you embrace it and believe it, but that's just not enough. That's deficient. That's not adequate. We need to add our works to that. Again, those are those are ideas that in some circles might be fairly common, but I think it's easy to demonstrate that they're unscriptural. So first proposition, I would put it this way. Scripture is absolutely clear that our works do not merit, and that's a key word, do not merit or earn God's grace and love. Okay, The fact that we do good works, or to use biblical language, the works of the law, you know, our obedience to God, is not what earns God's grace 
or earns God's love. Therefore, works for the Christian are not about earning merit before God to obtain eternal life. Now, there's any number of passages that are going to be tracking on this. Let's just go to Galatians 2. We're probably familiar with verse 20. Hey, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. But that actually has a context. Okay, there's something that precedes it, and there's something that comes after it. So if we go all the way back to you know, verse 11, I said we're going to read a lot of Scripture here, um, and we're going to do that. And I'm just going to comment on things as we go. So if we go to Galatians 2, chapter 11, this is the Paul-Peter confrontation. We read this, But when Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him. This is Paul speaking. I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. Okay, so Peter was enjoying meals, fellowship with the Gentiles. But when they came, these men from James, he drew back. Peter drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. He's, he's afraid that Jewish believers, you know, people who are you know, Christians, most likely, but really into the law that, that they're going to they were going to criticize him. So he he you know shrank back. He drew back. He separated himself from the Gentiles. Verse thirteen. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas. And Peter, before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, in other words, hey, you were buddying up with the Gentiles, and you know, that was fine. If you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? In other words, if, it, if it's okay, and apparently it, you believed it was correctly, you know, before the, these, these other men came, if you believed it was fine to do non-Torah-ish things, such as fellowship you know, have meals with Gentiles. But now you've recoiled as though it's wrong. Then, you know, where do you get the the authority or the, the even the coherence of telling Gentiles that they have to live like Jews? You weren't living like a Jew. So which is it, Peter? You know, which is it? And of course, Paul's point is that, you know, you were you were right before. The truth of the gospel is that we don't need to do Torah observant stuff. Again, these are issues of conscience. These are not issues of being right with God. So Peter, he, and Peter's the guy in the book of Acts who had the vision, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter says, oh, you know, I haven't eaten any of these unclean things my whole life. And, and God tells him what God has called clean, do not call unclean. And the whole point is that this was preparing Peter for ministry to the Gentiles. Well, Peter seems to have forgotten that, but Paul didn't. And Paul understood that theology, and he, he confronts Peter about it. He confronts him. We continue, verse 15, we ourselves, again, Paul speaking here, Paul writing, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. In other words, we're Jews, and we don't do some, a lot of that stuff that the Gentiles do. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. I mean, I don't know how much clearer you can make it. And yet we have a lot of Christians who for some reason, we're going to talk about those reasons today, somehow believe or are taught that they have to mix faith in Christ, they have to mix that with works to keep God happy or make God happy. And, and they might say, well, I'm not doing that, you know, to have eternal life. I know the gospel. I know, I know that salvation is not earned by works. Well, then why do you insist on doing or not doing certain things as though those are essential to have God positively predisposed toward you, to have God love you and like you? 
Why do you think that? It's not a coherent thought. And we're going to come back to the old, you know, old verse. You know, it, while we were yet sinners, you know, Christ died for us. We're going to add a few Ephesians. While we were enemies, hostile toward God, God loved us, showed grace toward us. Okay, it, again, those scriptural thoughts are incompatible with the notion that we have to do certain works or a certain amount of certain works so that God is kept smiling at us, so that God keeps loving us. It's just not true. But yet this is what floats around in a lot of believers' minds when you have clear scriptural statements to the contrary. And again, we'll, we'll talk about why that might be. Verse 17, but if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Again, this is another way of saying, well, if we're justified in Christ, then, you know, we can just do what we want. And then Christ is like the servant of sin. He facilitates sin. You know, it's the same question as back in Romans, you know, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And God forbid, Paul says, and he says the same thing here. ESV translates it, certainly not. It's megan oita, which is the same as it is in Romans, you know, God forbid. For if I rebuild, verse 18, for if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For, the, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. And here's verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify. Here's, here's what comes after the verse that everybody memorized. Here's what comes after Galatians 2.20. This one's just as important, maybe even more so. Paul says, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Again, I just don't know how much clearer it can possibly be. If you are believing, if you are thinking that your works, the works of the law, are what puts the grace of God over the hump, okay? That the grace of God is going to fail unless we have your works to mix in. That the grace of God is deficient without your works. Then you nullify the grace of God. And your theology says, even though your mouth might not, your theology says Christ died for no purpose. You know, again, Paul is blunt. He's clear. And we're going to talk about why, again, even... With this clarity, why people still get stuck on this. Here's another passage, Romans 3, verse 27. Paul, again, this is Romans 3. Paul has spent the first two chapters talking about, you know, the Gentiles being lost, you know, lost in their sin. And he talks about the Jews, again, being in the same state. And the Jews are kind of worse in some ways because they had the oracles of God. And then, you know, they're, they're still separated from God because they need to believe in the gospel. They need to believe in Christ. So he says in verse 27, trying to convince now mostly Jewish readers, you know, to, to think clearly about salvation. He writes, then what becomes of our boasting? And again, if, you know, he's talking about working, doing works, works of the law. What becomes of our boasting? He says, it is excluded. We don't have any reason to boast because salvation is not based on works. It is excluded by what kind of law? By a law of works? No. No, it's not excluded by a law of works, but by the law of faith. The fact that salvation is by faith excludes our boasting, because salvation is no longer dependent on our performance. Salvation in biblical theology is not merit-based. Verse 28, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith, those are the Jews, and the uncircumcised, the Gentiles, through faith, they're both, you know, they're both you know, justified the same way. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. And this, and this you know, the, the context of this is 
what Paul has been saying about the purpose of the law, again, to show us our failure, to show us that we needed grace uh, here in Romans 3. Going into chapter 4, Paul decides to illustrate the point with Abraham. Everybody knows who Abraham is. Again, he's talking to, to mostly Jewish audience. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. So it's what's owed to him. In other words, if salvation is by works, then God owes it to you. If Abraham was saved by works, by his behavior, by his performance, then God owed him salvation. And Paul is denying this. His wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. In other words, the person who knows, who, who doesn't depend on his merit, his works, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, believes the gospel, his faith is counted as righteousness. It's the opposite of works. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works, then he quotes the Old Testament, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Verse 9, is this blessing then only for the circumcised? Is it only for the Jew? Or also for the uncircumcised, the non-Jew? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. In other words, Abraham was, was right with God. He believed before the issue of circumcision ever came up. And it was, you know, Paul uses the circumcision uh, illustration here because the Abrahamic covenant was sealed with circumcision. That was the sign of the covenant. And Paul's argument is that, look, Abraham believed God before any of this circumcision stuff was even in the picture. That was the basis of salvation, not the work, not, not the deed, not the obedience that came afterwards. Verse 11, he, Abraham, received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him the father of the circumcised, who, not merely, who are not merely circumcised, but also who walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Now catch that. Abraham is the father of both groups, according to Paul. He's the father of the Gentile. Because salvation is by faith. It has nothing to do with Jewish rituals. It has nothing to do with Torah observance. But he's also the father, the leading figure for the Jew. Why? Because he believed prior to the circumcision. Salvation was by faith in both instances. And this is Paul's argument. So again, you look at this, how in the world can this not be crystal clear? I would say it is crystal clear. Uh, we'll move on to the next proposition. Number two, Scripture is absolutely clear that our works are not what causes God to love us or what keeps God loving us. Now, again, you know, the, sort of the, the, the go-to text here, and I think it really is important, but we're going to consider some other ones here, is Romans 5. Romans 5, I'll start in verse 6. Paul, same epistle, writing to the Romans, he says, For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. You know, weak there is, is a common New Testament you know, Greek term for to be weak or sickly or diseased or you know, have some malady or something. Well, our malady is, of course, sin, our separation from God. While we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, 
much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Again, a reference to the resurrection. Again, while we were yet sinners, while we were enemies, God showed his love for us. Christ died for us. By definition, God didn't wait for good performance to love us. Scripture states the contrary, the antithetical idea that while we were enemies, while we were in an adversarial position to God, he still loved us. While we were sinners, while we were doing all sorts of things that, you know, God does this please, he didn't, you know, God still loved us. John 3:16 I mean, everybody, it seems like everybody in the universe, you know, has heard this verse at some time. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, his monogenes, his unique son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It doesn't say whoever adds sufficient works while believing in him. It doesn't say whoever works. Okay, works are not part of the equation. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The, the verse is not a mystery. The verse is crystal clear. There's no mystery here. Colossians 1, 21 through 23. And you, again, Paul speaking to Gentiles now predominantly, and you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he, God, has now reconciled, you know, God, you know, really God in Christ in this particular verse, this part of Colossians. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, sounds like the book of Hebrews there, you got to believe, got to believe. Okay. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which is proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Notice it doesn't say now, you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his, in his body when he saw your, the, the change in your behavior. Okay, you were reconciled when when you turned your life around, when you cleaned up your act, when you just when you when you managed to do enough good works more than bad works, when you managed to contribute enough. Then God said, "Okay, we'll do the transaction now." It doesn't say any of that. Okay, He is now you know He's reconciled you in His body of flesh by His death. Okay? And, it, and because of that, he's going to be able to present you to God. If indeed you continue in faith. It doesn't say if indeed you continue to do enough good works. If indeed you continue to produce the quality of life that God is pleased with. It doesn't say that, folks. Again, the, the, the passages are clear. Ephesians 2. You know, I'm, I'm going to beat this drum because, this again, this just keeps coming up. Paul again, different letter. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. I mean, you're, you're sinful. You're following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. Okay, you're in Satan's back pocket. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. That's who you are. That's who you were. But God, once he saw your change of life, but God, once he saw you clean up your act, but God... Once he saw that you were serious about reforming yourself, but God, once he saw that you realized that you needed to keep kosher or do Torah or do X, well, you fill in the blank with whatever you want, and it's going to be wrong because the text says, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love 
with which he loved us. I mean, he, he loved you while you were all those things in the first three verses. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. <laughs> Again, I, I can't improve on what the New Testament says. How is it? How is it? that we could possibly, I mean, if you read passages like this, how is it that we could possibly think that our works are an indispensable supplement to salvation? How could we think that our works are essential to God's positive disposition toward us? It's theological insanity, but it's common. Why? You know, I, I think, you know, personally, and we'll say a little bit more about it you know, as we proceed, but just, you know, to kind of do a little sidebar here. I think because for anyone who's redeemed, anybody who's a believer, we feel shame before God when we sin. But our shame should not be allowed to pervert grace. It must not be parsed. You know, our shame must not be parsed as proof that God now hates us or that he's lost love for us. If anything, our shame is proof that there's something about us that has changed, not that God has changed. To think or insist that works contribute to salvation means grace isn't enough. That, that's really the bottom line. That's what your theology is. Regardless of what you say, if you're thinking that works are essential, that is your theology, that grace is not enough. I don't really care what comes out of your mouth. If that's what you're thinking, that's your theology, and it's not biblical theology. Since the grace of God was shown to us through Christ's sacrifice, then Christ's work isn't enough. Again, if that's what you're thinking, that's what you're saying. And I would take you back to Galatians 2.21, which we just read. If righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Or Galatians 5.4. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. And that's a problem. That's a problem because, you know, Paul's just saying you're, you're not believing the gospel then. You have to believe the gospel. The good news, the good news is that Christ died on your behalf. God loved you. Christ gave himself for you. And your faith, your belief, your trust in that is what matters. That's what matters to God. You don't, your merit, your performance doesn't play a role in this at all. Because if it did, then Christ's death is kind of pointless. Third proposition. Scripture is absolutely clear that since works do not amount to merit before God and are not what makes God love us, then works therefore must be a result of true faith that validates true faith. So if works aren't the one thing, then logically they must be another thing. So if works are not about merit before God and not about earning salvation, if they're not about getting God to love us, we're doing enough, hey, we're, you know, I'm active over here, Lord, pay attention so that you can look at what I'm doing so that you love me. If that's not what it's about, then works must be about something else. And the something else is that works are the result of faith and works validate genuine faith. Uh, we could go back to Romans 5. Now, we, we just read Romans 5, 6 through 10, but the preceding verses, you know, get at this point. Paul says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. First five verses, you know, Paul is getting at, look, we're already justified by faith, but when we respond, when we obey, you know, when, when, we, when we do the right thing in enduring suffering and you know, the circumstances of life, that produces character. 
it produces character. So works, behavior, what a person is behaviorally is going to be a byproduct in some way of responding to the gospel and then understanding that you, as Paul says, we stand in grace through faith. You know, this world is not our home. You know, we, we have eternal life. So life, you know, here really sucks, you know, but, but this, is, this world is not our home. It, it's going to help us to endure and rejoice in our sufferings. And that produces character. Another way of looking at this, and, and sort of the, the, the primary passage, primary book, you know, for a lot of this is James. We talked about James in the last, you know, Q&A. And so uh, some of this is going to sound familiar from episode 201, you know, our Q&A on Hebrews. We got into, into James, but I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to repeat some of that and add a few, a few other things. Because James is consistent with this idea that works validate real faith. Works are not a substitute for faith in James's theology. They validate faith. Faith is the essential ingredient for James. And I'm going, to, I'm going to show you why that's the case here. So if faith, you know, James is famous in verse 17, James 2.17, faith without works is dead. If, well, if faith by itself, in other words, if faith without works is dead, then faith is not alive, it's not genuine, okay, then faith with works is real. It's genuine. In other words, works validate faith. They don't take faith off the table as a substitute for faith. Okay, works don't eliminate faith. Works don't supersede faith. Works don't, you know, allow faith to be dispensed with. Works validate faith. If faith without works is dead, then faith with works is real. It's genuine and it's essential. It has to be there. Works validate true faith. The absence of works means the absence of genuine faith. That's, that's why he's even talking about works. James is not talking about works to say, oh, that faith stuff, that's, yeah, you don't need any of that. What you need is works. You need merit. You got to earn yourself. No, he, that's not what he's saying. The only reason he's talking about works is because he wants to know if your faith is real. That's the only reason the discussion is even happening in James. So this notion that he's doing a this bait and switch kind of thing is just false. Okay, it's bad theology. It's a bad reading. It's a, it's an inept reading of the text. The only reason he's even into it is he wants to know is your faith real? That's the question. Okay, James never says here or anywhere else that works are what saves. The primary issue for James is faith, not works. Now, this can be shown by asking the question, what is living or dead? Faith without works is dead, James says. That's what he actually says. He never says works without faith are dead. What James is concerned with, he's concerned with, well, what? I, I want to know, that, you know what's living or dead. And what he's concerned about being alive, being real is faith. Okay, his, his focus is still that. Even though his talk is about works, the only reason he's into the subject is he wants to know, is your faith real? You can profess lots of things, and if your life just doesn't show it, then James is saying, you know, I have every reason to doubt that your faith is genuine. He's not saying, you know, you, know, you, know, you got to realize that if you don't do enough works, you're not going to get to heaven. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, if I don't see works, then I, I just, I'm not confident that your faith is real. I'm concerned about your faith. I'm not concerned about your tally of works. I'm concerned about, is your faith real? Why would James be concerned about that? Because he knows faith is what saves. That's why. Now, from the earlier q and I tried to illustrate this. You know, I, I said the absence of works doesn't say, oh, crud, I just didn't work hard enough to merit eternal life. No. The absence of works says that faith isn't here. It isn't, it isn't to be found. Can't find it. Works are not a substitute for faith. Faith cannot be exchanged for works. Works show that faith is in the building. And I, I, I tried to use, you know, a couple you know, it's not exactly a syllogism, but I tried to, to use different vocabulary. So let, starting out with works and faith, I wrote and said this, 
works, that is our actions, don't produce faith. Works don't replace faith. Works validate or demonstrate faith. In other words, it sh- they show that faith is there, that faith is in the building. Works are therefore necessary to show that faith is real. Their absence invalidates a claim that faith is in the building. No, it's not. If faith was in the building, we would see works. Okay, he's talking about, you know, is it, is it living or dead? Is it here or not? And what is, what is it? Faith. Now, I, substitutes. I tried a few. Let's, let's do kind gestures and love. Same role, relationships for faith and works. Kind gestures don't produce love, do they? No, no they don't. Kind gestures don't replace love. And anybody, anybody knows this. Any, anybody who, who has a, 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 a single healthy relationship knows this. Kind gestures don't produce love. They don't replace love. They're not a substitute for love. Kind gestures can validate love, though. Someone loves you. They will be kind. Kind gestures are necessary, therefore, to show that love is real. Their absence invalidates a claim of love. Let's try obedience and loyalty. Again, the same relationships. Obedience doesn't produce loyalty. Obedience doesn't replace loyalty. You can obey without really being loyal, you know. You can do it grudgingly. You can obey biding your time for the moment that you can strike back. You can take revenge. You can leave the building. You can leave home, whatever. These two are not the same thing. Obedience and loyalty are not the same thing. Obedience does not produce loyalty. It does not replace loyalty. But obedience can validate loyalty. Obedience is necessary to show that loyalty is real. How could you say you're loyal to someone if you never obey them? It's absurd. Again, faith and works. We have to get these things straight. The only reason James is concerned with the works conversation is not because he's concerned. I just want to know that you've done enough, that you've merited salvation. Oh, I'm concerned about that. No, he wants to know if faith is real. That's why he's having the discussion. Now, a question. Okay, in light of all that, Mike, can we just sin all we want now? (laughs) <laughs> you know, to echo Paul, God forbid. I mean, you know, are you insane? You know, it, it, but you know what? If Paul got the question, who are we to think that we won't get the question? Of course we get the question because Paul got it. Again, Romans 6 is sort of a, a fundamental passage for this. Let's go to Romans 6, verse 15. Paul says, what then? Are we to sin because we, do, we are not under law but under grace? By no means, you know, Meg and Oita, God forbid, you know, no way. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to, does he say salvation? See, up above, he says in verse 16, let me read it again. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? See, people will read that and think, oh, yeah, yeah, he's talking about earning salvation. Really? Really? Well, try reading down three verses. Verse 19, I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations, for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to, he doesn't say salvation, it says leading to sanctification. Paul is not teaching salvation by works here. He's teaching, you know, if you surrender yourself, 
you know, you can surrender yourself to one thing or the other. You can do stuff that produces death, self-destruction, destruction of others. Or you can make your, you know, you, you, you can serve, you know, serve God, serve Jesus, serve Christ. And that will make you a righteous person. See, it's about doing right things. But he doesn't say in verse 9 that that leads to salvation. He says it leads to sanctification. It leads to becoming the kind of person God wants you to be. That's, that's, a, that's a normal way of putting sanctification. Sanctification, you know, theologians was like progressing toward holiness, you know. Okay, that, okay, you know, technically, linguistically, okay, that, that, that's how you would say that. But let's just like be real. Sanctification is the process of becoming more like Jesus. It's the process of imaging Jesus, imitating him, imaging Jesus, which is, of course, is also Im- imaging God. It's becoming more godly. It's becoming the kind of person that God wants you to be because he created you to image him. And he gave you his son, yes, so that you could have eternal life you know, through what happened on the cross. But he also, you know, and I've, I've talked a number of times on the podcast about how Christ is referred to as the image of God, the express image of God, that we are being conformed to the image of his son. Okay, God's son, Jesus. It, Jesus is the template for how to live. That's all this is saying. It's not talking about earning eternal life. And if you go on in Romans 6, verse 20, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Yeah, you know, go live it up. Okay. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Now, just, just a suggestion, profound thought here. If something leads to death, to self-destruction, it's not good, and you shouldn't be enslaved by it. That's all Paul's saying. But now, verse 22, that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and ultimately its end, eternal life. You're going to, you're, you know, you're going to become like Jesus. You, you, the sanctification is becoming like Jesus now. And ultimately, like First John says, when we are glorified, we will be as like him, as much like him as we can possibly be. You know, th- this is all Paul's talking about, imitating Christ, being conformed to his image. Why? So that he, he just, he decides to put up with you. See, well, we, we can't obtain this perfection. We can't obtain perfection. Paul's language is that we are in Christ. You know, when all this, this stuff about sanctification is going on, we are in him. We are united to him. Okay, we are part of his body. We are not just our own body now. We need to submit as slaves to this, you know, not the body of sin, our normal body, but this, this other body that we're united to. This is Romans 6. Go back to the beginning of Romans 6, and you have, you know, just look at the language there. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we shall be united with him in a resurrection like his. Our old selves crucified, that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. Okay, we have died with Christ, we believe we'll also live with him. Again, this the whole chapter starts with being in Christ, and it ends with, Again, this idea of progressively being sanctified, being conformed to the one whose body we are a part of, the body of Christ, being conformed to the image of Christ. And then ultimately, again, we're going to have eternal life, not because of our own effort. It's because we're united to him. That's why we have eternal life. And when we get to that point, again, as John says, and as Paul says in other places, we're going to be like him. We will be made like him. That's the end point. That's the terminus point, you know, for all of this. You know, another question. Okay, you know, if, if we're not just supposed to sin it up now, just do what we want, why should we, why should we care, though? You know, why, why should we put forth an effort? Okay, you convinced me, Mike, and I'm not just going to go out and, and sin as much as I possibly can, you know, so that grace will cover it. You know, that, that's the God forbid moment there in Romans 6. But, hey, I'm you know, I'm not going to put too much effort into the other either. You know, why, if I can't earn any favor with God, okay, I'll promise God that I'm not going to go crazy on the sin side. But why should I bother with good works? 
Why should I bother? What's the point? I would say there, there are several reasons why, you know, we should try to live a holy life. We should try to, as Paul just said in Romans 6, render our, you know, make ourselves a slave to righteousness. Again, we already know we'd, we're not going to earn anything by that because God loved us while we were sinners, while we were enemies, while we were hostile, while we were in Satan's back pocket. God, God loved us despite all that. Our salvation is by faith because of what God accomplished through Christ on the cross. Okay, we get that. Doesn't really earn us anything, so why should we do it? Okay, there are several reasons. I'm just, I'm just going to throw out three, first three here, just not in any particular order here. Our works are a service to others. That's one good reason why we should care about how we live. And even though we don't earn brownie points with God, we should be a blessing to others. Our works make, you know, make us a blessing to others or a curse. We serve you know, others or we don't. Our works make us useful for God's purposes or not. And you know why we should care? Because we're supposed to be imaging God. We're supposed to be being conformed to the image of Christ, Christ who is the template, the perfect image, the perfect example. We're supposed to be disciples. Imaging Jesus, imitating Jesus, is the definition of discipleship. And we do that fundamentally in two ways. And how would Jesus reduce this if, if Jesus were here and, you know, in the room and we, hey, Jesus, you know, how do we best imitate you? What, what, what do we do? You know, give us the grocery list. Okay, we know what he would say because he said it in the Gospels. Love God and love others. It, it's not that complicated. Jesus could reduce, and he actually even says that all the law and the prophets can be reduced to these things. You know, that, that's why he gives that answer. Love God and love others. You know, in other words, relate to God the way Jesus did and relate to people the way Jesus did. Love God the way Jesus did treat other people the way Jesus did. You know, so again, those three things, just again, not in any particular order, you should, good works are about being a servant to others because Jesus was a servant to others. They should be about being a blessing to others because Jesus blessed other people. They should be about being useful for God's plan. And Jesus was certainly useful. Okay, he didn't get sidetracked. Now, just a few verses, okay, a few passages here. Let's go to Titus 3. Titus 3, let's just go to 3 through 8. For we ourselves, again, Paul talking to his audience and, you know, including himself here. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy. Good grief, it sounds like Facebook, actually. <laughs> Passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified, by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. That's Titus 3, 3 through 8. Why should we do good works? We devote our the believers should devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. It's serving people. It, it, it's behaving. It's living like Jesus lived. You go down to verse fourteen. You know he, he sort of picks up the thought again. Let our people learn to devote themselves to good works, so as to help cases of urgent need, and not be unfruitful. Let me put that a little more negatively. And not be useless. Okay. Doing good works puts you in the position of God being able to use you to serve other people and to bless people. Okay, if you're thinking that your good works are earning favor with God, you are distracted at best. You're distracted. And you're really not imaging Jesus at that point. Hebrews 10, 24. And we saw this in our series. 
let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Well, in, in the context of Hebrews 10, it was like, look, you know, you you stir each other up to, to live as you ought because there's mutual benefit in the believing community to doing that. If you're all sitting around waiting to die, okay, if you're all sitting sitting around and it's like, oh, you know, we're, we're, this is the situation is just hopeless. You know, let's all, you know, just sit here and, and wait for death or something. I mean, look, that's not accomplishing what God wants accomplished, either in terms of your own mutual benefit as a community or in terms of what you're supposed to be doing with the lost world. You know, fulfilling the Great Commission is not waiting for death. Okay, it just isn't. Ephesians 2.10, we, you know, we have verses 2, you know, 8 and 9. You know, which again is the one every those are the ones everybody memorizes. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of your own doing, it's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we, here's verse 10, are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, God has a plan. God has something in mind for, for each one of you. He really does. He has something in mind. And you were created in Christ, in other words, you were redeemed, you were saved, for the purpose of good works. Okay, that, 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 it's a byproduct. Works are a byproduct of salvation. Ephesians 4, again, a pretty famous passage. This is where Paul you know, says that we are supposed to, verse 22, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. There's that idea of progressively imitating Jesus, progressively becoming more like him. At, at the end, at the end of the road, you know, if we remain in faith, as Paul said, and, you know, Hebrew says several times, you know, we're going to have eternal life, but we're also going to be maximally like him. We're going to be transformed upon our glorification. You know, when we pass through the veil, however we want to put that, you know, at the, at the end of the road, when we join the council, Hebrews chapter 2, we are made fit for sacred space. That, that, again, that, that's the end point. Therefore, Paul says, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For me, are, we are members one of another. Be angry and don't sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger. Give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone. Do you see a pattern here? He doesn't say back up in verse 25, having put away falsehood, good, you check that box, and now that you've, you've merited grace there, you've, you've, you've merited salvation, good for you. No, you live the right way. You put away falsehood so that you can speak truth with your neighbor. Good works are about blessing people, being usable to God, within the believing community and to a lost world. Be angry and don't sin. Let, let not the sun go down on your anger. Give no opportunity to the devil. Okay, you know, when he doesn't say, well, good, you checked off that box too. That, you know, that, that's more brownie points with God. No, it's so that you don't become a tool of the dark side. You should be a tool of Jesus, okay? Let the, let the thief no longer steal, but let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Bless people. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up. Again, metaphorically building up people, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Be a blessing. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with malice. Be kind to one another tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. So you can't do that if you're hanging on to the other things. Nowhere in the passage is, do all these things now, you know, get them down, make a list, memorize it, okay? Put them in your, on your, in your iPhone or whatever, you know? Make sure you, you, you chalk these off every day because then God will love you because then God will be happy with you. God might give you the time of day. No, you do these things to bless others, and to be useful to God. 2 Timothy 2, 20, we'll you know, just start in verse 20. Now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. 
Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use. Which is just a metaphor, you know, Paul's saying, you know, to believers, look, if you're living a certain way, you're not going to be useful to God. You're not going to be a blessing to people. But if you live righteously, you, you will do those things. Okay, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he'll be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So, therefore, flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. You know, join the club here. Have nothing to do with foolish ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. Boy, holy cow. <laughs> that's that, you know, that, that just, that's a, that's a gut punch, you know, for our culture today. And I'm speaking here of, of, of the believing community, not just the, the world. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. The Lord's servant's supposed to be opposite but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. You know, I'll confess, I don't always do that. I have to remember this too. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and that they, they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Again, why should we live a certain way? To serve others, because that's what Jesus did. To bless others, because that's what Jesus did. To be useful to God, because that's what Jesus did. I mean, the answer to your question of why do we do works is, is disciple. It's to be like Christ. It's not to earn God's favor. It's not to supplement sal you know, grace. It's not to put the cross over the hump. You know, the cross would have failed without my good work. You know? No, it's none of those things. It's none of those things. Our works also play a role. In, in those things, they, they, they play, in, you know, I, sh I should say, let, let me just add the next thought here before, before my, I get lost here. I mean, it's all those things. Our works also play a role in turning other hearts to the gospel. I mean, that's part of being, it's, it's kind of a subset of being useful to God, obviously. But works are also about helping other people believe, you know, showing them you know, m making this faith you're talking about something they want, something they, they know that they need. And also presenting your your community, your believing community, as something that that they would want to be a part of, because you've blessed them. Okay, you your community. This person knows they can go to for help. They can they, they know that they know that you're going to help. They know that you're going to help. I, I'm just thinking here about uh, Spokane. You know, I don't know how many weeks ago it is now, but we spent a whole hour talking about how Jesus related to people. Jesus always told people the truth. When they were in sin, he, he, didn't, he didn't tell them they weren't sinning. Okay, he told them the truth. But somehow, he made it impossible for them to conclude that he didn't care about them. That's really difficult. But that's the model. That's the template. You know, it really is worth something in our culture. I mean, we, you, know, you hear all the time about how, how the, the younger generation, they, they don't like the church because they don't see authenticity. Well, the solution to that is not to lie to them. It's not to tell them when, that their sin isn't sin. Somebody in their life should, should have a high enough regard to them, for them, that they tell them the truth. But at the same time, they also make it impossible to conclude that you aren't in their corner as well. Please don't destroy yourself with sin. If you do, I will be here. It's a really difficult balance. And again, nobody, nobody's saying it's easy. Jesus is the template for doing that because he told people the truth. But somehow they kept coming back. <laughs> the ones that seek him out are the ones who were, who were leading the worst lives. And he's telling them, you know, who, you know, he's not saying go live it up. I, I'm endorsing your behavior. No, he tells them the truth. And we have very specific episodes about this, you know, people who are Republicans and prostitutes and all, you know, I mean, you know, they that are sick are the ones that need the physician. You know, Jesus would say, well, you know, the physician is going to tell them what's wrong, but the physician is also going to have the solution. The physician is also going to be there when they need help. Again, it's a difficult balance, but, but he is the template for doing this. You know, just a couple of examples. You have first Peter one twelve. 
uh, concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that, that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which things into which angels long to look. I mean, there, there's there's some something to be said that you tell people, again, what they need to hear, even if they don't want to hear it. Because when you turn out to be right, okay, yes, you know, what I was doing for 5, 10, 20 years destroyed my life. You know, we have to believe that God is going to, you know, just like with the prophets, prophets are always telling people what they don't want to hear. But they were right. And people are going to remember who it was that actually told them the truth, who cared enough about them to actually tell them the truth. You know, and the, and the idea isn't that when that person comes to you later, you're, yeah, I was right, wasn't I? No, that, that isn't what you do. Okay. You bless them. Philippians 2, 14 through 15. Philippians 2, 14 through 15. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. See, see, you know, right there, let's just stop there. Paul isn't saying, do all things without grumbling or disputing that you can be perfect before God, that you can earn salvation. God just isn't going to have a gripe with you. God's going to have to let you in. No, he says, do all these things, be without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in labor in vain or labor in vain. You know, Paul, you know, this personal note, you know, from Paul, Paul, Paul's not saying do this so that you, you earn brownie points with God. He's saying people need to see the light. They need to see your life, this crooked and twisted generation. They need to see a little light in the darkness. And Paul's saying, look, you know, if you do this, it, it's going to make me feel good. It's going to make me feel that, that my ministry meant something. And it's, it's a, it's a, it's a brief, you know, fleeting, very human thing for Paul to say, but it, it's important. You know, do these things to be light in a crooked and twisted generation. And if you do, God will use that. Titus 2.8, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. Why? Why? So that God loves me now? No. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Now, the point of these verses is not so that you can win an argument. The point is not, hey, Titus, do this so that in the end you can win the argument. You'll be the champion debate. No. He's saying right conduct will validate a true message. People will judge the message by the conduct of the person giving the message. If you live the right way, people will know that the speaker can be trusted. And that, again, is being light in the darkness, you know, among, in, a, in a crooked and, and, and twisted generation. So, you know, there's any number of examples, you know, we, we could give here where the way you live impacts how people think about your message. And, of course, the answer to that isn't, well, okay, I, I won't tell anybody I'm a Christian, you know, I'm not going to give anybody the gospel. Well, you know, thanks for bailing on the Great Commission. Thanks for ignoring that thing that Jesus, you know, said before he ascended. You know, it might have been important. You know, those were his parting words, it might have been important. Um, you know, that's not the answer. Of course, the topic for our discussion here is why, you know, do we do we do what we do? Can we do it to bless people? We do it, you know, to be useful to God. We do it so that hearts will be turned. We do it so that we don't invalidate the gospel, that we don't invalidate the message. Believe it or not, the way you live can turn people toward or away from eternal life. It really can. Well, isn't God sovereign? You know, God can bring somebody else. Yes, he can. He can bring somebody else along. He can. He can do that. And God loves them, so he will. But see, now you've, you've filed yourself in, in, in the bucket, you know, when Paul talks to the Corinthians about suffering loss at the judgment seat of Christ. You may not care now. And it's not about being saved. You will care when you see what your life could have meant and could have achieved 
in the big plan of God. That's what the judgment seat of Christ is about. It's not about getting into heaven. It's about seeing the role that you could have played and being rewarded for it. You know, just just even even knowing that 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 the Lord is happy, you know, with something you did. And I, we've talked about this in Q and A's before. Everyone's going to suffer loss. Everyone's going to see where, you know, where they fell short. But Paul also says, you know, every you know everyone, you know, everyone who's at the judgment seat of Christ. I mean, those those who are believers, you know, and you you're right there. Everyone will receive some reward. You know, the the, the issue is that there will be some there'll be regret. You may not regret it now, but you'll regret it later. And, and it's not like God's happy. It's not, like, yeah, God gets to put the screws to you one last time before we have eternal, you know. No. Again, that, that's just twisted thinking. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a motivation knowing that God wants to use you. God has plans. Ephesians 2.10. You were saved, you know, for good works. God has plans for, for you. And for you to kind of blow it because you're human and, and dumb, you know, like, like we all are. That's one thing. But for you to just say, well, you know. I'm just going to I'm just going to make life easier for myself and not put myself in these situations where I might have to say something about, you know, Jesus or I might have to, you know, help somebody. I might have to be Jesus to somebody. I'm going to try to avoid that. You know, I'm going to eat Doritos here and sit on my couch all day long. You know, it, it, that's just being useless. And again, you may not care now, but you will care at some point. You'll regret it. Is what I'm trying to say. You'll regret it. The Lord will comfort you, but you'll you'll regret it. You know, and, and nobody wants to, to to deliberately heap you know regret um, you know on themselves. If, if if you're if you're in that camp, then you've got some sort of pathology. Uh, another thought here: our works are a representation of God, representation of Christ. Again, works are directly related to imaging and representing God. I mentioned this earlier, which in turn is directly related to being a follower, a disciple of Christ. Christ is the highest expression of imaging God. Just I'm going to go through these verses real quick, and then we'll hit one last question. Second Corinthians four four. I mean, think about this. You know, again, when you when you ask yourself or you hear somebody ask, "Well, if, if works don't earn me anything, why should I do them?" The answer is the short answer. The one word answer is discipleship. It's imitating Jesus. You know, then you can expand on, on on bigger ideas like you know, God saved you actually to do something. He has something in mind for you, and your works will either get in the way or facilitate that plan. You know, and and, and be like Jesus. Be a blessing. Be useful, be helpful, you know, honor God, you know, that the, the person who is seeking the gospel, seeking truth, they're going to see your life and be led toward it or away from it. Okay, th these are important things. But again, Jesus is, is the primary example. Jesus does all these things well, perfectly. You know, he, he attracted people to, to the truth. People couldn't, couldn't leave a conversation with him with the impression that he didn't really give a rip. Okay, he is the perfect example. So you have 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Uh, Paul says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Again, he is the perfect represent, representation, perfect representative. If you're, if you're familiar with this podcast, you know, it, you know about the concept of imaging. Imaging God you know, is representing God. Romans 8, 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That that that's that that's your destiny, okay? To be conformed to the image of His Son, being made more like Christ. That's God's plan for you ultimately. Colossians three ten, put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its Creator. And there's that imaging language again. Second Corinthians three eighteen, we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Again, this transform, transformation into the same image, into the image of, of God, you know, the, the, the image of His Son. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Now, notice he doesn't say, Let's clean ourselves up from every defilement of body and spirit in order to obtain the promises, in order to get eternal life. He doesn't say that. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. And this is a motivation, bringing holiness to completion. Again, we, we, we progress toward being conformed to what Jesus is. 2 Timothy 2.19 
But God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his and let everyone who know, who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. In other words, l- let's, let's have Jesus, let's have people see you and make that a, a positive reputation builder for Jesus. Okay. I think, I think the reputation of, of Jesus has suffered a bit uh, in, in our, in our culture. And it's really, honestly, it's because of Christians. You know, in some cases, people are offended at our theology. I get that. But there are any number of cases where we've given Jesus a bad reputation, and by doing so, given God a bad reputation by our behavior. Behavior has nothing to do with God loving us. He already loves us. While we were yet sinners, while we were enemies, while we were, you know, the grocery list, God loved us. But it has a whole lot to do with what the lost think about Christ has a whole lot to do with that. Uh, One last question. Why are these concepts, which are so clear in Scripture, such a struggle for so many believers? I think there's several reasons. This is no particular order, and part of this I'm going to be speaking to pastors here. Um, Again, this is just sort of a right off the top of my head here, right off the cuff. I think that even though they're clear, some people don't know them well. I mean, something being clear in Scripture and and someone really knowing what Scripture says are often two different things. Um, You know, it it really takes concerted effort to to grasp the content of Scripture. And and this subject matter, the relation of faith and works, is like anything else. That's the good part. Put a little more negatively, let me ask this question. Do you know this subject matter, the relationship of good works to grace and faith, to salvation? Do you know that subject matter? with as much thoroughness as you do other things. Another way of asking it, what are the things in Scripture that you really invest time in? Do you really invest time in, in, in this theological issue? You know, again, I've, I've met so many, you know, I, I, can't, I'm not, I can't think of anybody directly because people who usually come you know, to, to my events aren't, aren't so invested in, in one particular thing. So I'm going to just make a sweeping generalization. And I know, I know um, you know, I know by experience, I know by, by internet stuff and by going to different conferences and just lurking, okay, I know what I'm going to say here is, is going to hit home to somebody, and I hope it does. I'm not apologizing for it. I hope that it does. Okay, do you know this material as well as you know things about prophecy? You know, being an expert in prophecy and being kind of dumb when it comes to the role of the relationship of faith and works is not a good thing. The relationship of faith and works is more important than prophecy. Maybe it's demons. Maybe it's angels. Maybe it's, you know, whatever. There are just a lot of people who get absorbed in certain subjects, and then they just really, they struggle, and, and, and it, it harms them in, in many ways. They struggle with the, the whole faith and works thing. Can you defend your view of the rapture more readily than navigate the grace and works issue? If that's the case, that's sad. You know, if you know more about the ashes of the red heifer, or Gog and Magog, than grace's superiority to the law, I pity you. Because grace, there's just nothing more important than understanding the gospel with clarity. You say, well, you know, a five-year-old can understand that and get saved, Mike. Have you been listening? Okay, have you been listening? There are Christians everywhere in your family, in your church, in your circle of friends who can spit the gospel back to you. They know the verses, but they struggle with shame and guilt when they fail. Somehow the clarity of the gospel gets muddied in their minds. They are influenced by their emotions, by their feelings, by their guilt. And all of a sudden, the clarity of the gospel morphs into, I better buck up so God loves me. That is a problem. And again, if you know all this arcane stuff that by and large is a lot of speculation, let's be blunt about it. If you're a master of those domains and you can't help somebody with this one, I not only pity you, I pity them. It's just a misplaced priority. Another thought here, again, why, why, why do we have this problem? I would say in some cases we have preaching that is innocently misguided. And I'm speaking to pastors here. Uh, in other words, you know, one job of a pastor is to sort, you know, be sort of like an Old Testament prophet. You know, prophets were covenant enforcers. They have to remind people of 
prophets reminded people about the, how they should be living. And, and, you know, pastors have that job too. Pastors are to exhort the flock to follow Jesus, to live like him, you can follow his example, all these things. They're to exhort people to love God and love others, to be holy. You know, that's legitimate. But sometimes, I would say maybe even unfortunately many times, preachers fail to emphasize grace in equal measure when pointing out sin and failure. Sometimes, unfortunately, people are left to wallow in shame and guilt inside, which in turn makes them doubt that God loves them. Grace has to be given the high status it deserves, the high status it has in the gospel message, and it always will have in New Testament preaching. And, you know, pastors might say, oh, boy, that makes me uncomfortable. I'm, I'm, a, I'm almost kind of afraid to do that because, you know, people will probably abuse it. They might think, well, it doesn't matter how I live. I can just go do what I want. In other words, you'll be like Paul. Again, I've got news for you. If Paul had this problem, who are you? You're going to have this problem because Paul did. But knowing that, that this problem is out there, that somebody out there is going to, to think badly, think poorly and draw this conclusion knowing that's the case is not permission to distort New Testament theology by obscuring grace. It just isn't. It doesn't give you permission to do that. You owe people the truth of the whole counsel of God. And I would say, you know, also, again, just, and I know that, you know, pastors have a tough job. You know, it, this is, again, we'll add this to, to my list of why I couldn't be one, which is kind of long. I would also encourage pastors and not, you know, not rebuke them, but encourage them to just, you know, let, let's stop presuming that the spirit can't clean up a mess. Yep. People are going to draw the wrong conclusion. They're, they're going to, they're going to do just what the, the people that Paul had in mind when he said, you know, shall we continue in sin that grace may abide? You're going to get those people, but the spirit can clean up messes. Stop presuming it's your preaching that sanctifies people. It's the spirit of God that sanctifies people. It's not your preaching. Your job is to tell people the truth of Scripture, not to turn people into what they ought to be. Only the Spirit of God can, can do that and prompt people to make decisions about their behavior. Okay, it, it's part of sanctification. Sanctification is assisted. I mean, you, you know, when you tell people the truth about how they should live, people need to hear that. But I think preachers can get trapped in, into feeling like failures themselves, and then they sort of go overboard in one direction. They feel like failures when, when their people you know, aren't godly. You know, that, that's, that's understandable, but you've got to realize, again, a lot of that, if, if you're doing the job and telling them the truth, telling them the things they need to hear, then you need to leave the rest to the Lord. Okay, that's God's job. That is not in your job description. Your job description you've accomplished. You have told people the truth. And that means telling them about their sin. It also means telling them about the love of God, the grace of God. And in this case, showing them you know, what Scripture says about why we should live holy lives. Why Scripture does talk about this a lot. And it's not about merit. It's about being useful, being a blessing, so on and so forth, you know, Im imitating Jesus. Another one, and this is a little less innocent, and, and yes, I have experienced this in life. Um, Sometimes you have pastors who intentionally guilt people and like it. I mean, there are those people out there. Preaching about sin and, and about holiness becomes a control mechanism. You know, pulpit manipulation, to be honest with you, isn't that hard. Uh, it, it's a skill that I've actually seen cultivated, you know, by, by people. And it's, it's alarming. It's one of those things that just makes my blood boil. But it's out there. People do do that. It's dishonest. It, it, it all actually it, it smacks of sort of the, the the caricature, you know. I guess at, at the time historically it wasn't a caricature, but like medieval Catholicism, you know, holding withholding the means of grace, in, you know, in that theology to move herds of people or just the important ones to do what you know, get them to do what you want. It's just manipulation. You know, we, we we're just as guilty. You know, non-Catholics are just as guilty. You know, if we go back in the Middle Ages or whatever, wherever it happens, it can of course happen now. But our culture has been sufficiently paganized that lots of people who are Catholic don't care what the church says about most anything. So it doesn't happen that often. We on the, on the Protestant side, the evangelical side, are actually better at this <laughs> um, than, uh, than that situation, uh, unfortunately. You know, th this is just wrong. It's just wrong to 
you know, go the other direction where you preach in a certain way to make people think that not only do they have to do certain works so that God's happy with them, but they have to build you up as the leader, as the poobah in the pulpit, that they have to serve you so that God's happy with them. Again, I've seen that, and I've, I've had plenty of conversations with people around the country who've seen that too. It, I mean, being as kind as I can, that's just dishonest. I mean, it's, it's wicked when you come right down to it. And I, I would say you know, this kind of manipulation is one reason why every person in the pew needs a certain command of Scripture. You have to hold pulpit the, the people in the pulpit accountable. You just do. And, and if, if they are good people, they'll appreciate that. They'll, they'll know that that is a ministry to them uh, because, you know, you're all, they, they're, you're all equals. You're all images of God. You're all members of the body of Christ, so on and so forth. You know, you, people who are, are sincere about ministering to you, they will not mind the, your, your watchful eye. Again, if, if they know that, that, that you have their best interests in mind, it works both ways. It works two ways. Last thought here. Uh, I would I would think that uh, one of the reasons why people struggle with this this is you know the fourth thing I'll throw out again these are in no particular order but just things I've experienced either myself or I've seen I think one another reason the last reason why people struggle with this even though Scripture is quite clear is that we assign more validity to our guilt than we do to God's grace. Bottom line, that's what you're doing. You know, if if that's you, I want you to think about this in a different way. If that's you. If, if, you know, you're so, oh, I just, you know, I, I just feel so guilty and I know, you know, God loves me, but I just, you know, I, if, I, you know I, I just keep coming back to my feelings. What you're doing is you're assigning more validity to your guilt than God's grace. And if that's you, you have a problem with biblical authority. That might be a new way of looking at it, but, but that's what, that's what we've got here. You've made yourself, you've made your inner life, you've made your feelings a higher authority than scripture. And what you need to do is believe the truth more than you believe your feelings. You know, to which one of those two things are you assigning more worth? Uh, again, th this is going to sound trite, but I actually mean it. I think it'd be a good exercise to repeat Romans 5, 8 to yourself every day when you wake up, every night before you go to sleep, and throughout the day. Make it a reflex thought. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Your opinion of yourself is not superior to God's opinion of you. Let me repeat that. Your opinion of yourself is not superior to God's opinion of you. If you're making your opinion superior, again, you have a problem with biblical authority. God knew you while you were yet a sinner, while you were yet an enemy. He still loved you. So regardless of how you feel, that's true. So which of the two things are you embracing? The only thing in the way of letting the truth rule in your heart is you. You got to get out of your own way. And it's an issue of biblical authority. To which of those two things are you assigning more value, your feelings or what God says? Now, to sum up, again, what I'm hoping people get out of this is that there are a lot of good reasons to do good works. Okay, a lot of scriptural reasons to do good works to live a holy life as a Christian. Earning God's love is not one of them. God loved you while you were his enemy. His love cannot be earned, and it's time to accept that and live accordingly. And when you fail, when you're ashamed, remember he loved you even when you weren't ashamed. He hasn't changed, and he never will. Mike, I know, I think we've pretty much got the salvation and good works wrapped up, but can you speak about the different degrees of reward in heaven that is based on our good deeds? Yeah, boy, that's, there you go. Is suggesting another, another episode. Is that another episode? <laughs> well, just in, in, in a nutshell. What do you want to do a full episode on that? I'll mark it down. I mean, if you want to give us a quick summary, if you can, and we can well, put it down. Ultimately, that question is related to how we conceive about, you know, life in the, in, you know, in the new creation, because it, it's going to involve, you know, if, if we if we have the new creation, which again, heaven is really the new creation. And that's what we're doing. You know, we're, we're, we're restored back to the Edenic state. There's lots of things to do. And by definition, that requires different kinds of jobs. 
different kinds of, of duties. And I don't think any of them will be onerous or, or burdensome because, hey, it, it's, you know, it's heaven. It's the new earth. <laughs> okay. It, it's, it's everything it should have been. So I, I, I tend to think that, that a question like that, degrees of reward, is really about the, the, the kinds of tasks, the kinds of, of, of things that, that, that we do in the new earth. And you could, you could look on the other side and say, well, who cares? I'm there. I'm, I'm, I'm going to like it anyway. It's not going to be awful. And that's true. But th- there is going to be a, you know, there's going to be hierarchy there just by definition. I think more of the, of the if I can even use this, this phrase, more of the unfortunate side is actually about the, the judgment seat. It, it's just, it's knowing what our failures were. But again, that's going to yield to, again, the wonder of what the new life is. So I, I don't know if there, there, there might be an episode in that. I don't know. I'll have to think about it. But it's not that some people get good jobs and other people are going to hate their jobs, you know, in Eden. You know, it, it's Eden. Okay. It, it's, it's going to be wonderful uh, no, no matter what. But I think that the, the suffering loss issue is is a big part of this. But once you get in there, you know it, it's true that you're in. So I, I think if there's a negative part of this, it's it's just knowing, not necessarily you know a point of dissatisfaction of of, of what my eternal state is going to be. It's just knowing that in this life, by virtue of of the you know the reward issue, the reward ceremony, if you want to call it that, it's knowing that you disappointed you know, the Lord in some way. I think that's, that's really what's at the heart of, of using that kind of reward language for a motivation. All right. Well, I'm going to mark that down, Mike, because I would love for you to do. Yeah, we'll put some thought into it. Yeah, that'd be great. All right. Well, great. Hopefully we have an episode now that people can refer to for reference. So hopefully we have an episode now that's dedicated to that where people can point to and share. Hopefully, um, there's somebody out there, like you said, that is struggling with this. So hopefully they will come across this episode, Mike, and uh, hopefully have some peace. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think we've all been there at one point or the other. I mean, I know I was and on one particular point in my Christian life, you know, a few years into it. Um, part of it was my circumstance, but part of it, honestly, was I had to, you had to yield, I had to yield my feelings to, to truth. <laughs> I, had to, I had to give up, you know, winning the argument you know, valuing my feelings more than, than what God said. All right. Well, we hope all of our listeners share this episode, help our fellow Christians out there who are struggling with this uh, subject since salvation is the number one <laughs> priority. Uh, please, 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 please share it and get it to people who need it. And I just want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.